Well, it's only a piece of paper, they say. That's why lots of Australians have decided not to marry but uh, end up in a de facto relationship. And why bother getting married given the divorce rate in marriages are so high? Paper doesn't seem to make any difference. And yet it's interesting that we do know statistically de facto relationships have a much higher breakup rate and domestic violence rate. And we also know that gay couples want to get married. So it seems like it's more than just a piece of paper. What makes marriage marriage? At its heart, it's a covenant. And as we continue our series now, we're on week three, and as we look at exploring union with Christ, we're going to go into the past and see how our God is a God of covenant, a God who binds himself to his people, a God who binds himself to his covenantal promises to do good to us. Um, let's begin with um, the marriage covenant, because that's the one we know and work from there. Malachi, uh, the great Italian, Malachi, Italian pr prophet, that was a bad joke. Malachi 2.4 says this, you have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. So marriage is a covenant. What do we mean by that? It's, it's, it's built on promises that have become formalized. Uh, God makes it clear, covenants make clear um, not only the promises that are made, but the expectations in whatever covenantal relationship you're in. Uh, often it can be accompanied by a sign, but not always, like a wedding ring, uh, a written document, uh, a ceremony. Our God is a God of covenant. He's a marrying kind of God. Uh, God's not interested in just dating his people until, you know, something better comes along. He's not simply interested in turning up because it suits him or he wants to be your friend with occasional benefits. God is a God of covenant. He makes promises and then turns those promises into formal contracts that we call covenants. The first covenant uh, that's recorded explicitly in the Bible is that with Noah. There God had promised after that great flood never to unload a flood of world proportions ever again. In Genesis 9 verse 11 he says this, and then verse 13, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. Then in verse 13, I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So the covenant isn't so much just with Noah, it's actually with the whole of creation. It's a covenant that's really one-sided. There's no, it's not dependent on the faithfulness of, of, of humans. That is, regardless of how badly we have behaved, God has committed himself to never let a flood of world proportions ever happen again. And guess what? That's exactly what's taking place. The God who cannot lie has kept his word. And the, and the sign that he used was the sign of the rainbow as, as, as a marker for him and us to know that God keeps his word. You can trust him. Next is the covenant with Abraham 4,000 years ago. And the, really the promises to Abraham are steering, are the, kind of like the steering wheel for the whole of the Bible. Every event in the Bible is a fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham one way or another. So Genesis 12, uh, God begins again with a new word to an old man and an infertile wife. This 75-year-old Iraqi pensioner, Abraham, as I like to call him, uh, is given a word, just like God had given a word at creation, now he begins again. This time he's telling Abraham to go. Go and leave behind the sin of Adam and the sin of Cain. Leave behind the generation of Noah's rebellion and the Tower of Babel that wanted to make a name for themselves. Leave behind the gods of your father, Abraham, and go to the place that I will show you. Now God never gives a command without a promise. And here are the promises. Verses 1 to 3. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, since I'm doing 2,000 years and 30 minutes, I'm going to have to give you the stripped-down version for your sake in short, these are the promises uh, God gave to Abraham. One, Abraham was going to be the father of a great nation. Two, the nation would be both 
blessed and a blessing to other nations. Three, that nation would be given land. And four, though it's mentioned in Genesis 17, not here, that from that nation would come kings. So God makes the promises to a 75-year-old senior citizen in Abraham in Genesis 12. By the time you get to Genesis 15, maybe a decade's passed, still no kid, time's passing on, and God takes Abraham out of the tent and says, look at the stars of the sky, Abe. See, as many as there are stars, count them because that's as many as kids you're going to have, offspring. And, um, and then we're told, it's a very important verse, Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed the Lord, those promises God had given him, and he credited, that is God credited to him as righteousness. Gee, that's important. Um, faith, belief, trust is how God's people are always put right with God. It's not how good you are. You know that, don't you? It's by trusting in the promises of God. That's what makes you right with God. Abraham trusted the promises and in response, God counted him as being right with him. By the way, that's the principle. It's, the rule has never changed, by the way. Whether you live 2,000 years before Abraham, like, sorry, whether you live 2,000 years before Jesus, like Abraham, or whether you live 2,000 years after Jesus, like us, you want to get on God's right side, then trust in his promises. That's what secures union with God and union with Christ. Well, that's the promise. The promise gets reissued. And then God makes the covenant with him. Now, in, in the ancient Near Eastern world, this is how you made a covenant. God said to Abraham, go and get a bunch of animals. I want you to kill them. I want you to split them down the middle, except the little ones. Uh, and I want you to kind of make a pathway in between the split animals. This is how you kind of signed a treaty. And, and uh, as the sun was setting, Abraham fell asleep. And God represented as this kind of firing torch kind of passed between all the animals. And that was the way of signing the contract. And in effect, God was saying this, Abraham, you know those promises I gave to you, land, great nation, etc. He said, understand this, that if I don't keep those promises, that what happened to these animals may have happened to me. You see how God is kind of standing fully behind and committed to his covenantal purposes. And in verse 18, we're told, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. First the promise, Genesis 12, then the covenant, Genesis 15, and then if we had time, Genesis 17, the sign of the covenant, which was for Israel, circumcision. God giving his all to his people and his promises. I remember talking to a woman who became a Christian through explaining Christianity years ago. And uh, she was in a de facto relationship of about 30 plus years. I mean, she'd been living and with this guy. I mean, it was demonstrated. It was a serious, permanent relationship. And they even had grandkids, I think, and a uh, lovely woman. And, and I remember she became a Christian. And I talked about marrying her partner, who, by the way, wanted to marry her. But she didn't want it. She kept fobbing me off. And I, I couldn't work out why. And um, eventually, after a year or two, she finally said yes. And then I remembered what she said on the wedding day. She whispered in my ear. She said, Ray, you know, you're right. There was a part of me that was holding myself back from him. It was only by deciding to marry him I gave him my all. I'll never forget that. And that's a 35-year de facto relationship. It had become a covenant and she was fully committed. Well, God's holding nothing back. He fully binds himself to his promises. And now from Abraham, the next thousand years, God begins to systematically fulfill these promises. So we're going on a bit of a ride. We need to engage the brain here, so stay with me. Let me remind you, the promises to Abraham were of a great nation, blessing, land, and God's king. So point A, the promise of a great nation. From Genesis 12 right through to the Exodus 18, the children of Abraham just get bigger and bigger and bigger. That is, more and more of them. So it takes 25 years before Abraham finally has a kid. He's 99, Sarah's 85. By the end of Genesis, now four generations later, there's about 70 of them. Flip the page, you're in the book of Exodus chapter 1, and all of a sudden they breed like rabbits. They're everywhere. <coughs> Exodus 1-7. 
But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. God was keeping his promises. A bit like my Uncle Charlie's family. Uh, in four generations, they'd become 70. I said, cousins, you're on your way to becoming a country at this rate. <laughs> the only difference is my Uncle Charlie didn't start having a kid at 99. <laughs> and his wife wasn't infertile and didn't start having a kid at 85. Oh, they had become a great nation. The promise had been kept. God can be trusted. You just got to be patient because he's not in a hurry. Well, then God promised to bless his people. And uh, point B, we see that from Exodus 19 to Leviticus in the Mosaic Covenant. God had saved his people, Israel, from their enslavement to Egypt. He brought them through the Red Sea and placed them at the foot of Mount Sinai and there had entered into a marriage covenant with now his people, Israel. Uh, in the outline, in, the, in your uh, sermon outline, you'll notice I put the Mosaic Covenant as like a, on the side because it's a subset of the Abrahamic Covenant. It's not just a distinct covenant. It's, a sub, it's playing out that covenant, giving it kind of further dimensions. So here is God at Mount Sinai. He has his people gathered around him at this holy mountain, and it's kind of like, you know, when the bachelor hands the rose over to the one he wants and against all the other women. Okay, picture that. I don't know if that's a good picture, really. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, if you, fully, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You're the one that I want. Hoo, 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 honey. <laughs> Israel is singled out to be a holy nation, set apart from other nations, to be a light to other nations, can I say. I will be your God. You will be my people. This is a marriage contract. And Israel would know how to love God because of the covenant stipulations, the, the, the commands. That's what the Ten Commandments are. God's saying, you want to love me? This is how you love me, Israel, my bride. So Exodus 20, verses 1 to 3, get the, let's get the first one clear. And God says, God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Like your marriage vows, it's exclusive covenant forsaking all other lovers. You know, God never apologizes for being a jealous God, and nor should you. If your spouse has been with another, I mean, yes, I encourage you to forgive them, but can I say the act of fear, the experience of feeling jealousy is the right feeling. God never apologizes. When, when you get an exclusive relationship and there's been a breach in that, then jealousy is exactly the right feeling. I mean, managed still in a godly way, but yeah. Unlike the covenant with Noah, this was going to be a conditional covenant though. If they had turned to other gods, Israel would have to pay the price. If she became an unfaithful bride, which she did, then there was a cost involved. But what's clear is Israel knew exactly where she stood in this covenant relationship with God. He made it very clear. You know, can I say, using the de facto marriage analogy again, uh, the difficulty with many de facto, not all, but most de facto, is that there's no clear covenant, there's no clear promises. Uh, and things are kind of assumed, and that's where trouble happens. So um, is this a casual relationship, or a permanent casual relationship, or is this lifelong? Um, are, are you the love of my life, or are you just waiting until someone better comes along? Um, my friend asked me, he's actually a minister, and he went to visit a couple who were in a de facto relationship. They wanted to have their child baptised. And so he, he started talking, and then he said, by the way, just what's your expectation in this relationship that you're in? And at the very moment she said forever, he said three years. Well, that was a little bit awkward. You see, because there was no covenant, there were no public promises, there were no stipulations, it was kind of they fell into it with very different expectations. Well, Israel had no problem. She knew exactly where she stood. God had saved her and then defined what love looked like. So one of the blessings was God giving Israel his law. But the other blessing was giving Israel his presence himself. 
of all the holy buildings that had ever been built on the face of the earth, and there are lots of them, only one was ever promised the presence of God's name, and that was the tabernacle that ended up becoming the temple. God would dwell with his people. It was a great promise. And so what we've got here now is, on the next slide, God's people, under God's rule, but not living in God's place. We're not there yet. Point C, the promise of a land flowing with milk and honey. Forty years pass in the wilderness. Finally, God appoints Joshua to lead his people into the promised land. And a land that they get to enjoy. And they got to move into cities that they did not build. They got to drink from wells they never dug. They got to eat fruit from trees they never planted. God was blessing his bride and showering her with gifts. So now, next slide, what we've got is God's people living in God's place under God's rule. Here is the kingdom of God being played out, built on the covenantal promises of God. And then point D, the final one, God's king. Abraham was told way back in Genesis 17 that kings would flow from him and that the hope of Israel would now be tied up with the hope of Israel's king. And so King David is appointed, a man after God's own heart. And in 2 Samuel 7, as we saw last term, God entered into a covenant with him and made a promise that he, that from his line would come a king who would establish a forever kingdom, not like the kingdom of Israel. And God would bless the nations through that king. Wow, King David. We're now a thousand years down the track from when those promises were first made to Abraham. You see, God is a promise maker. He's a promise keeper. You can trust him. So what we've got, slide next slide, God's people, under God's rule, under God's king, in God's place. Isn't that beautiful? God keeping his word. But there was a warning to Israel. Remember that covenant with Moses was conditional, that if she proved to be an unfaithful bride, there was a price to be paid. And that's exactly how she was. Again and again, God is graphic in his language. She would constantly whore after other gods, worship the gods of the nations. Instead of being a light to the nations, she was more like a mirror to them and, and reflected and ended up, ended up becoming worse than them. And, uh, and so God would call her sometimes a prostitute, sometimes a whore, sometimes an unfaithful wife. Jeremiah 3.20, these prophets would serve as, as covenantal watchdogs, guarding the covenant, warning the people. Jeremiah is, is one of a, of, of a long line, and he says to Israel, speaking the words of God, but like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you, Israel, have been unfaithful to me, declares the Lord. And he warned his bride, if you keep on doing it, if you keep on doing it, if you keep on doing it, you will break this marriage covenant that I made with you, Israel. And after century after century after century of long, long patience on God's part, eventually God's patience runs out and the exile takes place and God removes his people from the promised land. They lose everything. They lose their land. In summary, they lose their land. I think we've got it on the screen. They lose their blessings. Is it on the screen? Yeah. They lose their land in the exile. They lose their blessings. They lose their temple. They lose their king. It's all stripped from them. The prophets were the watchdogs that kept warning Israel, if you keep on committing unfaithfulness by worshipping other gods, there will be a price to pay. Took God forever to bring about his discipline, but eventually he did. And yet the covenant with Abraham still remained intact. He was still going to be, he's still going to be committed to his promises. Because remember, when God went through those split animals in that treaty, that with the split animals when he made the covenant with Abraham, Abraham and he didn't walk together. It was, a, it was hinging on the faithfulness of God. And so what happens is this. These prophets, these covenantal watchdogs, not only kept bringing Israel back to the covenant and warning them, but they then started to speak of a new covenant. Because the problem with the first covenant wasn't the covenant, it was the heart of the humans in the covenant. That the heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. It's always been that. That's why when you're reading the story of Israel, it's like you're looking in a mirror. Man, are they ever going to learn? 
And so what God promises, and yet that's right and it's not right, because when God promises in Jeremiah 31, or rather he declares, you breach the old covenant, it's broken. But now I want you to lift your eyes for days are coming when there's going to be a new covenant. And those days have arrived, brothers and sisters. We're in them. A covenant, a new covenant. Remember the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament? It's just a Latin way of saying old covenant, new covenant. He's one God with two covenants. And the new covenant speaks of three promises in Jeremiah 31. Let me just quickly summarize them. In this new covenant that we're now in through Jesus Christ, we're told that what the old covenant could not do, God did by sending his son and then sending his spirit. And these are the promises that follow. Verse 33, promise of a new heart. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Instead of writing it on stone, it will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, they will be my people. You see, he's still committed to them. Although now the people of God will be Jew and Gentile. It doesn't mean that we'll always want to do what God wants us to do, but what it means is that the best part of us that's been transformed wants the best for God. What it means is that not only does God want us to want him, but now he has given us the ability to actually want him. Newfound desires in a, in a new nature. He takes out our heart of stone that couldn't give us stuff and puts in a heart of flesh that wants to, wants to obey God. And didn't you notice that when you became a Christian? I know for those of you who met Jesus on your mother's knee and you've you know, kind of always been walking with him, it's not as clear that kind of before and after, but, but just keep... Just keep thinking, if God were to remove his spirit from you, you would regress back. You might regress back to religion or a heart, but you will regress back to a hard heart. It is the spirit in us that has given us a new heart that says now, actually, I, I want to please God. I, 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 I kind of like the things God likes and I don't like the things God likes. And when I do the wrong things, now I've got a conscience problem and, I, and I'm feeling guilty and I want to confess it. I'm not the same man, neither are you or woman. But this required a spiritual transplant. It needed for us to be born again. And if you're not born again, then the good news is trust in Jesus and you will be born again. Receive him and you will be reckoned right with him as a gift. Well, that's the first old covenant promise, a new heart. Second old new covenant promise is that no more us and them amongst God's people. See, the old covenant, there were some who had the spirit of God and some who didn't. There were those who were priests and there were those who weren't. And the priests could access the presence of God in a kind of way in the temple, but most couldn't. You know, they got so far but no further. But verse 34 of Jeremiah 31, and this new covenant is going to be different. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. If you put your faith in Jesus and receive the Spirit, you get to cry out equally together, shoulder to shoulder. Priest, uh, sorry, pastor, congregation, doesn't matter who you are, no matter what gift you have, no matter how quickly it's been, how long it's been since you've come into the covenant community, you get to call the judge of all the earth, Dad, full access. I remember talking to one guy, he, he sort of lived a long life of hardcore rebellion. And I said, compare you and me, look at the differences between us. I, I, became, I gave my life to Jesus 35 years ago, I've been pastoring for 25 years. I tell you right now, if you said yes to Jesus now and put your trust in him, you will be as righteous as I am and together we'll be as righteous as Jesus is. In an instant, that takes place through trust in the promises of God. They will all know me from the least to the greatest. There's no more us than them. And then thirdly and finally, in the old covenant, let's face it, there was no forgiveness for adultery and murder and abortions. and you know, That's it. it just, there's, just no, there's just a death penalty. But in the new covenant, ah, verse 34b, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Now, you and I know that feeling of being reminded of some past sin that you've already confessed and repented of, but that guilt drives you to confess it one more time, just in case. You just need to know that when you do it again and again, God is looking at you and saying, I've got no idea what you're talking about. You can keep confessing it, but I don't know what you're talking about. Because I made a promise and by golly, I stick to my promises. And I made a covenant. And in that covenant is, if you come to my son Jesus, I will remember your sins no more. 
So yeah, you may want to come thanking God for the forgiveness that he's given you. That's the best way to treat that guilt. But stop actually keep stop confessing the same sin that you've repented of in the past. That is itself an act of faith and claim the forgiveness that is yours in Christ Jesus. And you will find that your Christian walk will be a much better walk, let me tell you, a more joyful walk. Well, friends, in closing, our God is a covenant keeper. Psalm 15, he says, uh, those who um, come into the presence of God keep their oaths even when it hurts. As a community, we need to stand shoulder to shoulder in support of the marriage vow. Because remember, marriage points to Christ and his people, the church. So I'm going to invite everybody to stand up, not just the married folk. Everyone stands up because it, symbolically, whether you're single, whether your spouse is with you or not, whether you're in a de facto, de force situation, whatever your scenario, we're standing shoulder to shoulder as broken, forgiven people. And then for those of you who aren't in a present marriage situation, you may want to quietly pray as those who are married, those of you who are married, you may want to hold hands, um, Work through these vows. And remember, you're not getting married. It's the word continue. It's the vows in an ongoing. You're reclaiming them, as it were, and making them yours afresh. Well, it's going to be the, the, the vows are on the screen. Now, of course, I'm going to say, you're going to hear Ray, but I don't want you to say Ray because you're not Ray. <laughs> Unless, of course, Ray is here. And, and you know, don't marry my wife. Um, you marry your own. Uh, and you just need to make the natural kind of appropriate applications. But, um, but I really want to thank those of you who aren't married who are actually standing. Because do it in a conscious way. Because everyone has to guard marriage, just not married people. Everyone, single, divorced, widowed. Together. I, Ray, in the presence of God, continue to take Sandy as my wife. From this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. This continues to be my solemn vow and promise. May God help me to be faithful to it. Amen. Remain standing and let me close in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for my brothers and sisters as we stand shoulder to shoulder, siding with Jesus who said, what God has joined together, let no person separate. May we protect, nourish and strengthen the marriages of this church. Help us, Lord, who are single to be content and forge healthy friendships. Comfort those who are wounded in divorce. Strengthen those who are single parents. Comfort those who are grieving the loss of a spouse through death. Comfort those who are living with the pain of a spouse being adult, uh, entering into adulterous relationship, Lord. May they know that you are a faithful God. Forgive us all, Lord, for those times we have wounded others and you in whatever relationships we have found ourselves in. And thank you for your covenant promises that through Jesus alone you will remember our sins no more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.